So first of all, I'm Shanda Burns. I'm the Senior Manager of the Community Development and Engagement Team here at RPAP, and I call Grand Prairie home. Uh, the cd &E team can be found across the province, working with rural communities on their attraction, integration, and retention efforts for healthcare providers. Before we get going with the main presentation, I want to acknowledge that Alberta is, um, is the ancestral homeland to many First Nations peoples, and within the boundaries of colonial Alberta, we live on the land of the First Nations Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8 territories, as well as eight Métis settlements and the Métis nations of Alberta. I am grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and are visiting. I also want to acknowledge the difficult positions many of Alberta Albertans have been in with the wildfires that continue to wreak havoc on our province and the amazing coordinated responses by emergency services from both the province the country and our neighbors to the south. And let's not forget our communities stepping up to support one another during times of need. We at RPAP want to let you know that we are thinking of you and hope you are safe in this difficult time. Today, we are thrilled to have two guest speakers joining us from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, or formerly known as CPSA as well. Uh, we have with us today, Scott McLeod, CPSA Registrar and CEO, and Stacey Strilchek, CPSA Council Chair, to tell us about to tell us more about their work in rural Alberta, particularly in physician recruitment, and how they're working towards accelerating registration for eligible internationally trained physicians. Without further ado, I will turn it over to CPSA's executive team. Thanks very much, Chandra and Holly, for uh, having this uh, organized for us today. And uh, thank you very much for RHPAP for the opportunity to spend some time together uh, this morning. My name is Stacey Strolchuk. I'm the chair of CPSA Council, and I've had the privilege of being on Council now since 2019. Uh, this is my fifth year on Council and second year chairing uh, Council as a whole, and uh, very much uh, wanting to just take a few moments um, just to thank RHPAP for the work that you do. Um, you know, I certainly value rural medicine and team-based care. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time in rural Alberta, um, particularly in the primary care setting, uh, having experience with RHPAP in the past and current. And so I did want to take a couple minutes uh, to say thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I also want to personally thank uh, Dr. Caffaro for his time from CPSA uh, and being part of RHPAP. Uh, I think it very much lends to uh, what council, I believe, has certainly been focusing on, and particularly in our strategic plan uh, that was recently approved uh, with one of our uh, strategic directions being enhanced partnerships. And that truly is something that uh, we are focusing on as council, and I know that we're focusing on as an organization. Um, and so to have uh, the commitment to have Dr. Caffaro at the table uh, to build and continue to uh, foster those relationships are very important. Uh, and value added. Uh, so, you know, in short, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation today, and I truly do want it to be a conversation. Uh, you know, I'm looking to, to seek your thoughts and comments on how we can support each other in the work that we do in medical regulation and protecting the public, um, but also to be able to add value in your work that you do on a daily basis on keeping health closer to home in rural Alberta. Uh, and lastly, I, I want to do a bit of an informal shout out. Um, I believe Annie Lankow is on the on the call today, and I want to say congratulations to you uh, becoming a great aunt uh, the other day. Uh, welcome to the world, uh, Warner, and I look forward to to meeting him soon. So, with that, I will turn it over to our registrar, Dr. McLeod. Thank you very much, Stacy, and uh, <clears throat> just want to echo some of those comments. It, it really is. Uh, a trem tremendous pleasure to join everybody here today. RHPAP is an essential component of our healthcare system here in Alberta. Um, and as Stacy pointed out, one of our key strategic directions is enhancing partnerships, because in order for us to meet the needs of Albertans, we have to do this together. Uh, and we're thrilled to spend time here today and share a little bit about what we do uh, and look for ways we can work together. And uh, you know exactly what Stacy said, we really want this to be interactive. Uh, I'm not going to spend the entire time talking about the presentation. I think we get through this. The real value comes from the conversation, the questions that may come a little bit later. 
So I'm going to touch on some key things here in the presentation, um, but uh, but please don't hesitate to ask some questions uh, when we get to the end there. I too just want to recognize that uh, CPSA um, respectfully acknowledges we're on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional gathering place of diverse Indigenous peoples. We strive to honour and celebrate the histories, languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples throughout Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 8 territories, as well as in the settlements uh, and Indigenous communities across Alberta. Through this land acknowledgement, we commit to building and nurturing authentic relationships with Indigenous peoples as we work towards culturally safe, equitable health care for all. Um, and and we, we put together that land acknowledgement because it really truly is a meaningful thing for us. And you'll see when I talk about our strategy that building those authentic relationships with Indigenous partners is incredibly important to us. Uh, and we look forward to continuing on this work moving forward. So I'll start off now. Remember, I can't see everybody on the screen. So uh, if somebody has a hand up or anything, I'll rely on somebody to, to point it out to me. Uh, but I'll quickly give you an overview of CPSA. And most importantly, I think it's important for everyone to understand that the Health Professions Act is what gives us all of our authority to do our work. So even though we are not a government department and that we are independent of government, uh, we are accountable to the legislation that is provided by government. Um, and therefore, uh, any authority that we have to do the work that we do has to come from that legislation itself. Um, and every province uh, has similar uh, acts that uh, create the existence of a regulatory authority, but all of the provinces and territories also have slightly different acts uh, that establish regulation, which can also be part of our challenge in trying to have consistency across the country. Um, but three of the things that are really important uh, that come out of that act is our responsibility as an organization to set standards of practice. And I need to be clear that these are professional standards of practice as opposed to clinical practice of stand or standards of practice. We also have the CPSA code of conduct. And what we also have is we've adopted the Canadian Medical Association Code of Ethics and Professionalism as the code of ethics and professionalism that we expect for all physicians who are, are granted licensure here in um, Alberta. So our CPSA Council um, is an incredibly important uh, governance body over the, the CPSA, sets the direction and, and policies for the organization and establishes the strategic direction. Um, recent legislative change has led to there being an equal representation for elected physician members and and uh, members, public members appointed by government. Uh, I th think this is a really good balance of making sure that we are putting the public interest as our priority. We are here to protect the public and not represent physicians. So having the physician perspective is obviously important and having accountability for the profession is important, but we have to ensure that we're doing this in equal partnership with members of the public uh, who are those who receive the medical care by our regulated professions, professionals. Um, and so uh, we, we also have our council meetings open to the public. Uh, so anything that is discussed uh, openly, uh, anybody can actually register and, and observe our council meetings as well. So we recently just completed a uh, strategic plan and uh, council just approved it just, just over, a, I guess it was just under a year ago, uh, it would have been the council meeting last year in May. And where we established the vision of the organization to be a professional, ethical and competent where we want professional, ethical, and competent physicians providing the highest quality care for all Albertans. Obviously, we want to make sure that that happens. Um, and our core mission is to serve and protect all Albertans, contributing to their health and wellness by supporting and guiding physicians to proudly provide high quality care together with healthcare partners and patients. So it, um, we, we specifically put the proudly providing high quality care because Physicians do take a lot of pride in the work that they do, uh, and they want to see Albertans get the very best care. And we want to continue to promote that, but also making sure that this is done in partnership 
with other healthcare players as well as patients as equal partners in that provision of care. Um, there are six, sorry, there are five key strategic directions for that strategy. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into depth on these. Uh, a lot will make perfect sense to you. I don't think that it would be uh, anyone would question why we would have these as strategic priorities. Certainly having the highest quality, compassionate and ethical care um, is, is something that all of us want to have and that we can certainly play a role in that. We talked about enhancing partnerships. There is no organization in the health system that can do this on their own. And the more we work together, uh, the better chance Albertans are gonna get really good care. Uh, proactive and innovative approaches. This is something where we're really, um, I think that we're leading the country in many ways uh, because we have established a whole department on innovation, research uh, and analytics to make sure that we are on the cutting edge and that we are making evidence-based decisions in the work that we do. And so regulation hasn't always necessarily used evidence-based approaches, uh, but it's one of our core values in evidence-based uh, evidence decision-making. Anti-racism and anti-discrimination is obviously an incredibly important thing that we all need to look at. Um, we know that there are uh, quite variable um, outcomes for for patients who access the healthcare system because racism and discrimination does exist. Uh, there is institutional racism that exists within the healthcare system. And we're all on a journey of learning and, and eliminating racism and discrimination. But the regulator does play a big part in that. And we wanted to make sure that in order for us to have a sustained effort in this area, we had to make it a part of the strategy and invest in doing this work. And uh, I think we're, we're in the process now of developing the actual action items that go towards uh, making this a reality. And I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of advancement in the future. We also touched on the authentic indigenous connections. Uh, it's incredibly important to build uh, those strong relationships with our indigenous partners across the province and even more broadly across the country, to be honest, and, and have a, the opportunity to learn uh, from their knowledge and expertise and, and know how we work best together to make sure that we address some of the racism, discrimination, and just to learn uh, about the Indigenous cultures and, and where we can all go and work together to make Alberta uh, the best healthcare system. So what do we do at CPSA? Um, not everybody knows the, the depth and breadth of everything we do. Most people think of us as the place that gives people a license to practice, and then we just take in complaints uh, when they come up. But the registration of physicians and physician's assistants uh, is a little bit more broad than that. And we'll get into more depth on that a little bit later. But yes, we do grant people the license to practice. And granting a license to practice in Alberta is more than just saying that they have a set of credentials. Um, it, it's making sure as well that there's a commitment to meet the standards in the code of ethics. Uh, and it's almost like a, a, sh a shared commitment to make sure that Albertans are getting high quality health care. Um, so the registration process, uh, it we have an obligation to make sure that when somebody gets that license to practice here in Alberta, that there's been an assessment of their competency to provide care in that area or that domain um, that they're practicing in, whether that's family medicine or internal medicine or surgery, or whatever it is. We have to be confident that they're competent to practice in that area. Um, but the other thing a lot of people don't realize we do is we support physicians in their ongoing continuous competence and maintaining their, their competency throughout their entire career. Uh, and we have an entire department committed to doing that. We've got a variety of ways of, of making sure physicians do that. And that can be in the ways of independent practice reviews. It can be chart audits, uh, just reporting on their learning activities, participating in quality improvement projects. There's a variety of different ways that we, we ensure that physicians are continuing to learn. There's so much medical knowledge out there right now that the half-life of medical knowledge is, is diminishing into the months, not the years um, that it used to be. So it's important for physicians to stay on top of things. The other thing a lot of people don't realize we do is we accredit health facilities across the province as well. That can be diagnostic imaging facilities or it could be um, lab facilities. And it's a, quite a large department within CPSA to make sure that any of these facilities 
are meeting safety standards so that when a patient goes in to get the, the testing that they need in those facilities, that it's being done in a safe uh, and appropriate way. Um, I'm gonna leave managed physician related complaints uh, to a little bit later. Um, and I'll touch on the other ones here. Guiding professional conduct and ethical behavior. We touched on that when I said we develop the standards of practice and the code of ethics. Uh, it is essential that we set the expectations for the profession and we hold them to account. Uh, and that goes into the, the physician related complaints. But if we provide the guidance and the support in an ideal world, we wouldn't be getting complaints. Um, but that it's just not realistic uh, to, to say we'd never get any complaints. But if we can provide the appropriate guidance and physicians um, behave within those professional guidance, it, it decreases the risk of those complaints. And then we obviously contribute to policy, uh, public policy on healthcare. We uh, sit on many different groups across the province and work with our partners to try to establish good, strong public policy in healthcare. So the complaints process itself, <clears throat> I'm gonna to touch on it a little bit later in the presentation as well, uh, but this is where we are, are mandated to have a system where patients can, or anybody can file a complaint against a doctor and their professional behavior. And there are a multitude of different routes that that, com that complaint can go, uh, but we are obligated to take in that complaint and deal with it uh, appropriately. And it is a quasi-judicial process, very formal in how it's done, um, a lot of legislation around how that is done appropriately, as well as appeal processes that go along with it. Uh, that is a big part of what we do, and we take that very seriously. But over the last two and a half years, we have completely revamped that department to make it much more efficient and much more effective in how we can manage those complaints. Um, we've historically had a fairly significant backlog in complaints, and uh, our new processes uh, are, are getting rid of that uh, backlog and, and we're catching up and, and meeting some very specific timelines in addressing complaints. So we're gonna touch on some physician resource numbers here because uh, I don't think it's gonna come as any surprise to, to those on the call here that um, <clears throat> the physician resources have been a challenge, uh, obviously in, in rural communities in Alberta, but we are also seeing some changes in, in larger urban areas as well. So although we can show that there was a growth of physicians of 167 uh, between quarter one, 2022 and quarter one, 2023, that is not a very significant increase in the number of physicians uh, for a large population like Alberta. And if you see that there were 120 that uh, went to Calgary, that means that there were very few that went elsewhere across the province. And you'll see that there was actually a, a, a drop of 14 even in Edmonton. So that's a quite a significant difference. Um, if you get into other areas, uh, you'll see that, you know, like, uh, you know, um, Red Deer saw some increase of 24, but Wetaskiwin lost two, Spruce Grove lost two, Medicine Hat. And when you talk about small communities, a loss of one or two physicians is very significant. And uh, so, and I, I know I'm I'm talking to those who are living this every day, but this is an important uh, thing for us to address. And RHPAP is going to be a very important partner in the work that we do moving forward. But we're very fortunate that um, Alberta has a very large and and very important group of. Uh, physicians that have been trained outside of Canada. Uh, they're identified as international medical graduates, uh, but we are very fortunate to have incredibly talented graduates from around the world that have been able to help out in many communities across, across Alberta. And uh -huh. that's been very beneficial. Nearly 35% of the physicians in Alberta uh, have trained outside of Canada. Um, so some of you may know about our practice readiness assessment process. Uh, so I'm going to brag a little bit our, about our program. And, and Michael uh, Cafaro is on the call here. And I want to have a shout out to him and his team. Because Alberta, although there's a lot of news and a lot of media coverage about there being barriers to access a license um, in Canada, and we hear a lot about Alberta, Alberta is leading the country in this area in doing assessments. We have an ability to give somebody a license to practice, even if they don't meet the clinical, or sorry, the, 
um, the Canadian standards for licensure. Um, they may not meet the requirements for the Royal College of Physicians or Surgeons or the College of Family Physicians of Canada to, to have an equivalency to their certification process. But we can say, you've at least had some degree of equivalency and we can test you, we can put you into a community and assess your practice and be confident that you're gonna be safe to practice when we give you a license and the community is gonna benefit from your expertise. So we go through a two-part process um, where the first three months is called the preliminary clinical assessment. And it's done in, an, in a separate location, a different location than where that physician is gonna end up working. And that's to make sure we don't have any bias, that the community may not see flaws because they need somebody there. We wanna have that independent assessment. But then the supervised practice assessment that follows is gonna be in that community where they practice um, and start and they can start billing for, for service and, and building that connection with the community. Alberta also has the ability to do these assessments, not just in family medicine, but also uh, for specialists. And we have done more um, practice readiness assessments than anybody else in Canada, any other jurisdiction in Canada. And, and several other jurisdictions don't even have this process. So they can't, um, they can't do an assessment and so therefore, if somebody doesn't have their credentials, there's really no route for them to, to get into practice. This is a typical timeline that takes place, 21 weeks from a review of qualifications uh, to finishing their practice, uh, their, their um, clinical assessment. And so that you know, may seem like a long period of time, but as long as everything clicks along, it's actually quite quick to get somebody into the community and into practice. Uh, and that's been, that's been proven to be quite effective. The other thing that's benefit to our program is we don't have points in time where these things start. There's an ongoing registration of physicians to get into these programs and get them into the community. So you don't have to wait for like June 1st to start a program. When we've got availability of assessors, we can get people into those communities and, and that can start moving forward. So what we did do though is, is because we're an organization that does wanna to continue to look at new and innovative ways of doing things, we looked at some jurisdictions around the country or around the world and thought, you know, their programs aren't that far off. <clears throat> and so is there a way that we could streamline their registration? And so we, um, we created a five-year pilot project to look at an accelerated registration program. And, um, the goal here was to evaluate whether certain international graduates um, may begin independently practicing in an identified community faster while still ensuring patient safety is the top priority. And that's really the important thing is making sure patient safety is the top priority. Um, we can remove a lot of administrative barriers, but we really can't remove those safeguards to the community. We've heard quite clearly from many communities that yes, you need a physician, but you don't want a bad physician. You need a good physician, they're providing care. And our job is to make sure that we don't remove the, those regulatory safeguards. So although in this case, we waived the first three month assessment, that PCA phase, what we did do though, is we put assessment markers on later on in their work so that we can reach out and make sure that they are providing high quality care after we have um, after we've registered them and allowed them to practice. We've just moved an assessment. And I would argue that we may actually have a better longitudinal, longitudinal assessment of their competency in the community where it's important. So um, I think we've been able to reduce administrative barriers while still protecting um, those safeguards for the public. There's been tremendous interest in this so far. Uh, it was it it um, was activated, I believe it was January 16th, and we've already had 89 applicants uh, for that for that route of licensure. So uh, I think it's a positive thing. We have some individuals that have already started in their assessment, uh, and I think and we've got an assessment program that's going to follow this over time and make sure that we're not uh, creating any harm to the community as we do this as well. So this has been quite positive so far. Uh, and I hope uh, communities across Alberta are, are starting to see the benefits soon. 
So this is just kind of looking what the timeline for the project is. So we can now get somebody into a community significantly faster, three months faster than we did before. So it reduces that time from 21 weeks down to nine weeks. Uh, and I think that's pretty significant, getting people to where they need to be. Um, supporting access to physicians in Alberta. Uh, a couple of other things that we have we have done as well. We've created a non-clinical register. So what we want to do is we want to make Alberta an attractive place for people to come. We also know that a lot of uh, physicians step away from practice for a multitude of different reasons. It could be health concerns. It could be raising a family, committing to the family. There's lots of different things. It could go on educational leave. And so what we want to do is recognize that reality and give people an ability to step off of a clinical practice, go into a non-clinical work environment for a little while, reduce the cost to them um, through their license, which reduces their fees dramatically. And then they can go back on to the regular um, register quite easily. Uh, and it allows people to save a little bit of money and, and move back and forth between the two. So it's just one of the other things that we've uh, instituted to try and make Alberta a little bit more attractive uh, than other provinces that may not have that as well. The other thing we're working on is changing the, the sponsorship agreement. Right now, when physicians go through the practice readiness assessment, uh, they need to be sponsored to go through that process. And that's to make sure that the, the physician gets everything that they need through that process. And right now, Alberta Health Services is the sole sponsor uh, for the practice readiness assessment process. Um, but council has given us the go ahead to expand that sponsorship um, model so that we can approve um, those other than non-AHS non facilities to, to be sponsors. Um, the sponsors will actually have to apply to CPSA and demonstrate that they're how they're gonna meet the criteria to sponsor a physician. And part of that includes the financial requirements to sponsor a physician as well. Uh, so that a lot of the cost is not put on the, the shoulders of the physician specifically. Um, but changes do not include CPSA being responsible for physician resourcing, meaning that we're not going out and recruiting physicians. Our job is not to recruit the physician. Our job is to make sure when they're recruited, we can get them that they're going to be assessed to be competent to practice. Now, obviously, we want to work with anyone doing that recruiting so that anyone recruiting knows what the requirements are going to be so that no promises will be made that we may not be able to, to achieve. Okay, um, I'm going to jump into professional conduct, but I'll just do a quick check if anybody has any specific questions at this point. Scott, it's Andrea here. We have one question in the chat. Sure. Um, they were asking what type of license uh, the PRA and pilot project IMGs are granted. So whether that's a provisional license or the general, and then are the PRA physicians supervised after that initial three months in clinical practice? So they, uh, they are on the provisional register. And uh, if they successfully complete the pilot project, they can be transitioned onto the general register. Um, the, and this, the provisional register is not a, an ongoing supervised requirement. So it's not like that they have to report to another physician. They work independently uh, in Alberta. Thank you, uh, that's all we have for now. So there is a question here about, is it true that physicians cannot report on another physician's unprofessional conduct? And I'll touch on that right now. It's a tremendous segue. So, so I, hope, uh, I hope I answer it in the coming slides. So just make sure my, there we go. So um, I, I touched a little bit on our role uh, in professional conduct because as a profession, we are responsible to make sure that those who get a license are, are behaving in a professional manner. So we, we support uh, Albertans and work with their physicians to resolve complaints. Uh, and there's a multitude of different ways that we can do that. But it's, as I said before, it's very strictly regulated um, by the Health Professions Act. The, the other thing is that 
we don't believe that just punishing physicians is the way to actually change behaviors. We really want to approach this from an educational perspective. So if there's a, a chance to turn a complaint into a learning opportunity for a physician, then we're going to take that route because that will have a much greater impact. As soon as we get into a disciplinary approach, it becomes very adversarial and you get lawyers lined up across a desk and we often don't have the outcome that's in the best interest of, of patients. But obviously we have that route if we need to go that route. And there are some very specific areas where we have no choice, but we will go down that road. Um, timeliness is also incredibly important because we know that <clears throat> these complaints sitting pending for long periods of time can be very frustrating, both for the complainant and for the physician. <clears throat> but it really does depend on the complexity of that complaint and whether we have to get expert opinions um, and do that full investigation as required. So we, we have done a lot, as I said earlier, to reduce um, the time that it takes to process our complaints, uh, but some just inevitably are going to take some time. Uh, and each complaint is unique, uh, and it's an opportunity to learn, like I said. So if we can, we have really been working hard to evolve this from a purely disciplinary type of approach to things to much more of a learning opportunity. So. I'm not going to go into this in detail. I think you can look at this uh, a little bit later as well. But this is to give you a general idea as to where things can go. So we receive a complaint. <clears throat> that's reviewed. Uh, and then we, we go out and actually get a physician's response to that complaint. Because it's really important to know uh, the circumstances around the complaint as well. Once we get that, there's a triage that takes place. And it could be that it's a conversation that just needs to take place. And there can be a consensual resolution to that. There could be a complete outright dismissal if, if we find that there are no grounds to, to move that forward. It could go on to investigation, and there's lots of options that go there. And the other thing we can often do is just get an expert to look, look at the case. And it could be dismissed after that because the expert opinion has determined that the, the quality of care was good, or there may need to be further responses. And as you can see, <clears throat> it all goes down to the end where... Um, it could lead to a hearing, it could be dismissed, it could be resolved with consent. There are a variety of different options that we can get to. Um, and, and we want to make sure that along the way in all of these, if we can use this as a learning opportunity, uh, it helps that physician improve the quality of care that they provide, and it helps prevent anything from happening again in the future. So <clears throat> this is a little bit, just a, a quick um, graph to show you that not many go to hearing <clears throat> uh, and that um, a lot of these can be resolved with consent um, and or, or they can be directly resolved. And, and we only send one to 2% to hearing every year. Now, unfortunately, when you use that <clears throat> number, it can be interpreted in many different ways. If you're a physician, you go, okay, well, great. Very few go to hearing. If you're the public, you would say, well, why are you not disciplining doctors who are, are misbehaving? And, and and doing your job and protecting the public. But it really does come down to the fact that we, most of these are learning opportunities. And most complainants, when they report to us, they're not actually looking for the physician to be punished. They're looking for the physician to learn and change a behavior so that others don't have to go through what they went through. So if we do that properly, we shouldn't have to go to hearing and punish physicians. Um, and that should be the rare event, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Um, <clears throat> just to note there that the continuing competence department also is involved, that if we have a physician that needs to learn and needs to have a practice review, then we can bring in other um, parts of the organization as well to help out with that. Uh, sexual boundary violations is a very specific requirement in legislation, though, <clears throat> and these are the ones that. Um, you're going to see more of these going to an actual hearing because the legislation is very clear on this. And in April of 2019, Bill 21 was passed, the Act to Protect Patients. Um, and this is where the findings of any unprofessional conduct related to sexual misconduct, uh, and that can be sexual misconduct or sexual abuse, and those are very clearly defined in legislation, um, that there are a very mandatory process that comes through with that. Um, and you'll see that this 
this is directly related to patients and patients only and patients as defined in legislation. And a patient is defined as <clears throat> anyone up to a year after the date of ceasing a patient physician relationship, that person can still be considered a patient. Um, so it's not just immediately, can't just say you're not my patient anymore and then you can enter into a relationship. There has to be that cooling off period. And if you've ever provided, if a physician has ever provided any kind of psychotherapeutic treatment, treatment, um, it it doesn't matter how long that took place. Uh, you are never. It is never appropriate to enter into a relationship with that individual. And so the results of that can lead to, you know, if, if there is a finding of guilt um, with respect to a sexual boundary violation, they will. Um, there is if you're found guilty of sexual abuse, it is a permanent revocation of your permit. And any form of um, misconduct will lead to uh, some degree of, of permit suspension. So very significant penalties related to that. So to touch on the question there though, that physicians can't report, in actual fact, our standard of practice says they must report one of their colleagues if they, if they are not meeting the standards of practice. Um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta is more than just the body of, of people working here in Edmonton. It's every member of the profession that practices. We all have a responsibility to uphold those standards that exist. And if a physician um, is aware of somebody practicing inappropriately, it is their duty to report that. Uh, and, and the legislation is even clearer around sexual misconduct and sexual abuse because any regulated health professional who becomes aware of that type of uh, behavior, they can be, um, a complaint can be filed against them and they can be held accountable for not reporting it. So it, it's really important to address uh, any form of unprofessional behavior. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with a little bit of information uh, about, uh, <clears throat> about how you reach out to us. And if, no matter who you are, if you're looking for guidance, please come to us. There's a lot of information that's out there that is not grounded in, in fact. And there are a lot of assumptions being made about who we are and what we do. And we want to be that source of truth. And if you ever have a question, if you ever have a concern, don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you ever want to submit a, a formal complaint, then please reach out to us. Uh, our customer experience team, which is the CX team, can guide you through that process and, and all the options and, and what the steps are. Uh, if there's any tricky situation in a clinic and you need some advice, just reach out. Uh, that's what we're here to help with. Uh, or if there's any question about even opioid prescribing, we've got experts that can help with that as well. So the, the key there is we, we want to be as open as possible. If anybody has a question, just ask. Um, and then you're going to get the, the truth about what's going on with us. We also have a find a physician tool. Uh, you can go on there. You can learn a lot about a physician. You can type in the name and then they're, they're going to come up and you're going to basically learn their name, location, practice, discipline. Um, and, uh, and instead of, we actually link to uh, Alberta find a doctor as a method of um, finding new, new patients because ours is, is not necessarily um, that up to date. The other thing, if you look on our website, you're gonna see if there's any disciplinary actions taken against the physician. Uh, and we're obligated to report any disciplinary actions that have taken, uh, certainly hearing tribunal findings are there as well and the contact information. I hope that makes sense. And another key piece of information, which you can, uh, request to get access to our messenger, which is a, a regular newsletter that goes out with regulatory updates, standards of practice, also hearing tribunal findings, um, and, uh, and those continue to, uh, to be put out every month. If you wanna learn a little bit more about the practice readiness assessment, uh, the pilot project that we have, then and even just the readiness assessment itself, you can look back, uh, I believe the February 20. 23 issue. Yeah, February 2023 issue has a lot in that as well. And finally, if you have any questions, uh, this is how you contact us. So like I said, we, we want to be that source of truth. 
if something doesn't make sense, it probably doesn't make sense. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out and we'll help you out with that. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. And then we can uh, see who else is on the screen there and see if anybody has any questions. Scott, I have one more that came through. Um, it sure. says the PBM exam is no longer only written two times per year, question mark. Sorry, repeat that again, sorry. That's okay. It's asking about the TDM exam and if it's no longer only written two times per year. Michael, do you know the answer to that one? Uh, certainly the TDM exam at this point is still uh, in a January and June uh, timeframe for dual writings. Uh, I can also advise that MCC has been approached by multiple parties with regards to broadening the timeframes or the uh, availability of that exam. And Michael, did you want to just touch on, you, you also typed in the question and answer there um, about the PRA project, uh, and it's not being tied to CFPC examination or the Royal College? Uh, yeah, I certainly can. You know, based on our criteria that we're using around uh, jurisdictions that appear to be equivalent to Canada, um, and, you know, and remember, this is a pilot, it is an experiment, um, but what we're postulating is that uh, physicians from certain jurisdictions who have success in our PRA process do not necessarily need to go and demonstrate uh, their mastery of the uh, practice by successfully challenging their Canadian credentialing exam. So for a family doc, that would be becoming a certificate of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, or if you're a specialist, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And so we've exempted them in this pilot um, and, you know, again, uh, council uh, has a keen interest and will be provided in time evidence or data around the success that these individuals have. Um, the hope is obviously with the way we've structured this, that these physicians will demonstrate that they are successful in practice and thus exempting them from the exams uh, will be an appropriate move. Any other questions? There, there is, a, I see there is a question, the question and answer uh, in Northern Alberta, which is, Northwest Alberta, why can we not have access to the clinics in Dawson Creek for MRI? We need to access that. <clears throat> GP is behind. We cannot afford to go to Edmonton. Our council had a great presentation from him. I don't know who him is. And we have tried with the health minister, uh, has had this for one year. Now that I can find out, we can talk to you. Yeah, it may be better that we talk offline because we don't really have if we're talking about accreditation of a facility, that would be different. Um, and there are accreditation requirements, but we can certainly talk offline if that helps. Scott, is there any way that you can touch on um, if CPSA is involved in privileging or what the difference is between privileging and credentials? Because uh, that's been coming up quite a bit. And I'm wondering if we can just shed some light on that. Sure. So if we're talking about privileging in a health facility, for instance, yeah, so that's granting the privilege to work in that facility. And part of the privileging process would be to ensure that you have a license to practice. So what we do is we say um, they have met the core requirements to be granted a license to practice as a family physician or as a general surgeon. But for a general surgeon to work, for instance, they have to work within an Alberta Health Services facility. And Alberta Health Service determines determines who is going to be able to work in that facility. And so they get privileges to do that. And that's a privileging process that they go through. Um, and have, like I said, having a license to practice would be a requirement to gain privileges within a hospital. I'm going to just ask if uh, Stacy or Michael want to say a few things, if, if I've missed anything in the presentation. I know I went through it quite quickly uh, and I may have missed some key things. So if, if Michael or Stacy would like to jump in and make any comments, I like to hear what their thoughts are. Scott, would it be okay if we just went back to the Q&A? There is a question oh, uh, sure. from an anonymous participant. I can go through it here. Uh, the question is, is the accelerated route to licensure competency assessment that, of $10,000, I'm assuming that means the uh, IPR for the PRA pilot, is that cost a barrier in any way? Who would be responsible to cover this cost? Um, so very briefly, the cost represents um, the true cost to CPSA of actually doing this sort of uh, competency assessment, 
which is sort of the quid pro quo to being able to enter into an accelerated process for licensure and possibly accelerated access to the general and unrestricted register. Uh, at this point, uh, anybody who wishes to uh, go on to the PRA through the pilot uh, has to agree voluntarily that they understand this cost may be theirs to bear. Um, we uh, would not be surprised if, as an example, uh, sponsors decide, as so AHS as an example, they may, as part of their business plan, decide they're going to support an individual physician in this regard. But that would be outside of our of our um, uh, of our uh, wicket, so to speak, in, in terms of that. Um, at least where we sit in registration on the assessment side, um, we have not had, and we've got a pretty close eye on these people applying. Uh, I have not had information provided to me at this point that anybody sees um, this cost as a barrier as they go into practice. That has not come to my attention uh, and to our colleagues. Do you want to touch on possibly the cost savings because the first portion of the assessment is not there? Uh, certainly. Um, the cost savings, uh, well, the total cost of, uh, of, of a sponsored position for both parts, which don't occur in the pilot, can easily approach uh, anywhere between sixty-five dollars and $85,000. Uh, and you eliminate the majority of that cost, easily $45,000 uh, as a minimum, by not having that PCA or the first 12 weeks. That would otherwise uh, that would otherwise um, uh, be assigned. So there are significant savings and significant time savings as well, of course, in being able to move someone into their community uh, more quickly. Thanks, Michael. I see there's there's another question down there about a uh, physician who practiced uh, in Egypt. Um, what I'd suggest is if there is a specific individual to reach out specifically, because it's very difficult without knowing the circumstances of why, why somebody may get uh, a license here or somewhere else. One of the things that I, I did mention is that every province does have different legislation that we live by, and therefore there may be different um, uh, requirements in, in different provinces as well. Hard to comment on a very specific case, uh, but if there is a situation where that person wanted to come back to Alberta and wanted to have another look, I'd, I'd be happy to, to have that conversation. The one thing we've also found is that in a lot of these cases, in fact, I'd say very rare to see an exception to this, when we're asked to review a specific case and people have heard a story about something, there's a lot more to the story. Um, and in some cases, we're not even aware of a person even applying here. Um, and, and that can be a challenge as well. So yeah, individual cases are tough to respond to. I see, I see. Uh, clinical assistant program. Um, Michael, do you want to touch on the clinical assistant or the limited practice registry? Very briefly, the clinical assistant program is that um, portion of our, it's a special register. It's called the limited practice register. And it's a, a supervised register. That is the physician on that register cannot practice independently. Uh, but these individuals provide a very valuable role within our AHS facilities, providing assistance to regulated members, physicians, and other healthcare teams uh, in the care of inpatients, primarily in patients undergoing surgery. Not every jurisdiction in the country has uh, this particular uh, type of physician, and, and is primarily for the physician who only has a single year of postgraduate training which is not sufficient to meet the uh, expected standard for Alberta or for Canada by and large. Uh, and I know Alberta Health Services at this time is looking at some significant expansion of that program to help cover off their, their service needs. And there's more on our website about that. It's called the Limited Practice Register and anyone can access that information on our website if they'd like to know more or contact us as per Scott's coordinates earlier. Thank you, Michael. Um, there is a, a question there about uh, finding assessors as well. Uh, Michael and his team have done a lot of work in the last couple of years of, of getting more assessors trained to be able to have access to the assessors. So we're doing better on that, uh, but we continue to train more uh, physicians as assessors. Uh, if I've missed anything on that, Michael, feel free to jump in as well. 
Yeah, no, I think that's an accurate summary. Uh, I mean, at this point, the only thing that potentially holds someone up in actually getting their assessment started, assuming they've completed all of their registration activities, is the assessors, you know, need a break from their previous assessment. And sometimes they take holidays as well. Uh, but we at this point have a solid uh, number of assessors, especially for rural family medicine, uh, and an increasing number for uh, family medicine in so we say larger centers, regional centers like Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. So we're actually fairly well populated, but always accepting uh, applications from individuals who are interested in doing this work. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of others here I just want to touch on. Sorry if I missed them. Uh, Andrea, please jump in if I'm going to miss anything here. There was a, could you please speak to how the jurisdictions for accelerated pilot programs were selected? These were based on um, jurisdictions at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the College of Family Physicians of Canada had, had deemed to have um, a, a degree of equivalency to the programs. So we were confident that if the national certifying bodies had deemed those jurisdictions to be equivalent, that our the risk to Albertans was diminished. We're not the experts in that uh, specific area of, of what would be the credentials required to be a surgeon. We rely on our national certifying bodies to, to do that work. And that's why we chose jurisdictions that they had approved. I hope that answers that question. Uh, let's say a few words about how AHS and CPSA work together for sponsorship currently. Michael, you might be able to answer that the best. It, it, certainly, I mean, our role is not in selecting communities. Uh, or positions at all. Um, and it, it is the, uh, at this point, as a, the sole sponsor, AHS does their best to make a determination as to where the need is greatest, uh, including, by the way, an increasing number of positions uh, in uh, the community that may not be tied to an AHS facility. Um, what we try to do essentially then is when they present a candidate or when candidates identify they've been sponsored by AHS, is that's where we put them in line to actually go and be uh, be assessed in our PRA in our PRA process, um, but that is the the limit of it. We do not actually push individual physicians towards a sponsored position, uh, and we play no role in that selection. That's great, thank you, Michael. Um, there is a question about uh, any extra details on what the uh, new CPSA route to spawn route looks like. Uh, the route to sponsorship, uh, that will, more information on that will come out after our upcoming council meeting. And so you'll be able to have more information about uh, sponsorship after the upcoming council meeting next week. Um, physician assistance is a question there. If you really want to learn a lot about physician's assistance, uh, I would, and, and I have got a tremendous uh, respect for the work that our PAs do. They're a great value to the healthcare system. And the Canadian uh, Physician Assistance Association, or the Canadian Association for Physician Assistance, has got a great website to go to that talks about what physicians, uh, physician assistants do, and uh, and we have a little bit of uh, information on our website as well. Uh, we could probably send that link out, and that would help you as well. Um, and Michael, you may want to answer that if a IMG has received an eligibility letter from CPSA before January 2023, will their assessment period be three or six months? Uh, it, the hard start date was January 16th of 2023. Individuals in the pipeline before then have the ability to withdraw and try re-entering uh, registration process uh, to access the pilot, but otherwise they are on a course to complete, um, if I can say this, the usual uh, practice readiness assessment process. Hand it over to Stacy if she had any closing remarks. Thanks, Scott. And uh, thanks, Michael, as well, for answering some of the questions. Um, you know, I will close by saying that uh, personally, you know, this has been a journey of learning for me now for five years, and I learned something new uh, every time we have these conversations and every time we have the opportunity and privilege to to meet with you, uh, to ask and listen uh, and to understand uh, from the public perspective and from stakeholder perspective uh, what CPSA can, can do to sort of enhance our relationship in the community. 
And so uh, the two areas that I think I just want to highlight is uh, the concept of right touch regulation, uh, as well as being open and transparent, is something that I think is very much baked into the culture of both CPSA Council and the organization as a whole. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite confident and, and, to be honest, quite proud of um, the direction that we're moving uh, from a CPSA lens in being uh, open and transparent about our process um, and how we how we want to do business and how we want to be a good partner in the community uh, and how we want to ensure that we're continuing to achieve um, you know the right touch regulation, but also to protect the public. And so I encourage all of you if your questions haven't been answered or if you want a bit more of a follow up or you have new questions as they come along, uh, this is an opportunity to just start the conversation. And I know I think I can speak on behalf of, of Scott and the organization and council to say that uh, we encourage you to do that follow-up in whatever shape or format that looks like. And uh, we look to be able to continue our relationship with our HPAP and very much appreciate the work that you do. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity today. I want to say thank you to Scott, Stacy, Andrew and Kennedy, as well as Dr. Caffaro. Uh, for your presentation and for answering all of the questions today. There was a ton of them. You did very, very well. And I know that you're more than willing to do follow up So thank you very much. I know the more informed we are as citizens about these particular things and the happenings in our communities, the better equipped we are to help.